first person shooter that arguably propelled the entire genre to general popularity. Sure, there were FPSs before it, but none were quite so impressive. On Mars, alone against the amassed forces of hell with no assistance but your arsenal of weaponry. The story was bare bones, sure, but it showed all the imagination of a child doodling in a school notebook, and that was fantastic. The blood effects, amongst other factors indicative of the times, made sure that unfounded controversy about the game would spread. This practically ensured the game would be a legendary success, of course, and you would expect a series would follow. With a similar looking Doom 2, a darker, updated Doom 3, and a year after that, a film. You'd have thought such a series would provide good fertile ground for a great action film to spring forth. Well, strap in as I pick my way through the Doom movie. As the film starts, we're told that it's the nearish future, and there's been a teleporter discovered on Earth that leads to an abandoned city on Mars, and no one knows how it got there. Spoiler alert, we're never told how this got here. Sadly, this is the start of a trend in the film of super pointless dialogue which doesn't give us any information about the world, characters, or move the story forward. Using this particular excerpt as an example, if we weren't explicitly told that this was a found bit of technology, then it doesn't feel like too much of a stretch to expect your audience to assume in this future society that they have invented a quick way of getting there and back. Ultimately, this example on its own would not be a huge issue, just a touch distracting. The reason I'm kind of fixating on it is that it's not the only example, and there are plenty of others scattered throughout the film. Oh well, moving on, as I said, we're on Mars, which is definitely a decent concession to the source material, and the scientists there send out a message that there's a monster killing everyone. It's here we're introduced to the squad that the film will focus on for the majority of the film, in a scene that manages to encapsulate the stereotypes that each of our soldiers will be embodying for the duration of the film. The speed at which each character's personalities are conveyed here is, I think, a brilliant feat of filmmaking for a film like this, where the characters don't necessarily need to be all that deep. The two marines that do get more depth are Sarge, the boss of the squad, played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Reaper, played by Carl Aomer, son of Eowund, Urban. Reaper is something of a Mary Sue character in that he's devilishly handsome, a capable soldier, and knowledgeable about the sciences, also scarred by his past when his parents died in some archaeology incident on Mars, which is never explained or elaborated upon. This also caused him to be estranged from his twin sister, played by Rosamund I Have One Facial Expression Pike, who just so happens to be working up there now. The monsters for most of the film, when they're in the light, are actually quite fun and nasty looking, in a kind of off-meat way. Not exactly unique or distinct, or even inspired by the game so far as I can tell, but fun. The real problem, though, is that practically every fight involving the monsters for most of the film are contrived to be in locations so dark that you can't make out anything except the silhouette of the creature. My best guess is that they did this because the prosthetics wouldn't look very good in motion, but it's still frustrating when you can't see anything, especially when they turn on the lights in a given room and prove that the darkness contrivance was entirely pointless. The troubles on the planet seem to revolve around the previous civilization their research is into genetically engineering their populace, and Earth scientists attempting to resurrect and continue that research. And I know this won't be a problem for a lot of people, but I get quite annoyed when the idea of, look how many chromosome pairs this species has, they must be superhuman, gets pulled out. In the case of this film, they go for the number of 24 pairs rather than our normal human 23. I'm just going to list out some Earth species with 24 pairs of chromosomes and move on. Chimpanzee, gorilla, hare, and potato. You'll have noticed a complete lack of the word hell since the introduction where I talked about the games. Well, the film seems to acknowledge that the Inferno is a thing in the games, with characters talking about hell and using Christian mythology from time to time, but it never builds into any substantial actual entity. This to me feels like a shame, as the film could have used something to make it more engaging, not to mention being more connected to the games. The only other thing besides the name and Mars that harks back to them is the inclusion of the BFG, which has quite a cool CG goopy effect when it's fired, but it's only shot twice in the film, which makes it feel more like fan service than anything. Although, that's not true. There is one more thing that makes explicit reference to the film being inspired by the games, and that's a sequence near the end when the action transfers into first person and we get a character searching for survivors amidst the myriad of monsters. This would be a great homage to the games if most of the creatures that were being fought didn't look like they were just dressed in haunted house attire and cackling. It just comes across as silly. 
Although a couple of the CGI creatures in this sequence, considering the time, aren't too bad. If there's anything in the film that's worth watching, though, I'd say it's this sequence. It's daft, but it's unique. I'd like to say just one thing in passing, but it involves a pretty major ending spoiler. So if my whinging about this film has somehow convinced you to watch it, I'll give you an out here and say thanks for watching. The Rock makes a really fun last act bad guy. He does the commanding officer losing his mind and morals thing really well and seems to be having a complete blast doing it for the final act of the film. I just wanted to give props where props are due. As for the first two acts, he plays it pretty straight and almost blends into the scenery of the film. It's also really quite refreshing to have sibling interactions be the crux of the film's drama rather than a, some love interest that's been shoehorned in. With all that said, I'd say the Doom film is a pretty generic sci-fi action film. Not horrible, but certainly not worth going out of one's way to find and watch. Thanks again for watching. If you'd like to see more video game films reviewed by me, there's an annotation on the screen to go to my review of Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. And there's a big red subscribe button, which is the best way to not miss any future reviews I do.